Thought Leaders, brought to you by the Geelong College OGCA. Good evening, everyone. So I just want to set the scene and I'd like to provide some background on Diana. Diana's got over 20 years experience as a lawyer, a director, a business owner and a consultant. And she first attended Morongo Girls College and she was school captain back in 1992. And after completing her law degree, which was at Deakin University, uh, she successfully worked as a workplace relations and corporate lawyer at top tier law firms and as in-house counsel for several large Australian businesses. And during this time, she also became the first female president of a men's AFL Metropolitan Football League and was also the first woman appointed to the VFL Tribunal. She chaired the groundbreaking AFL Victoria Fair Game Respect Matters program, which was amazing. And she drove the creation of more inclusive and safe club environments for women and girls. And Diana's commitment to her community continues to drive and direct her activity. In 2010, she became director of the Geelong Football Club. And in December last year, was appointed as the club's vice president. Diana is also the chair of GoTape, chair of Anamkara House Geelong, a trustee on the Melbourne Convention and Exhibition Trust, and a Geelong Authority board member. So Diana, welcome. Thank you very much, Mike. It's um, wonderful to be here with everyone tonight and thank you to you for the invitation. Uh, I saw uh, College Board Chair Dr Hugh on, on the teams uh, just a little bit earlier, so good evening to um, Dr Hugh Seawood. Um, I also wanted to say hello to all of the um, Geelong College community who are, who are on the line and also to all of the Morongo girls. When you tell me, um, Mike, that it was back in 1992 that I was school captain of Morongo, um, I feel somewhat aged, but I'm sure we'll be okay tonight. <laughs> well, I'm going to start there actually and take you back to your time in school and, and ask you that question. When you were sort of year 12, did, did you know or have a clear idea of your career path? And, and have you been somewhat surprised by the, ter by the direction it's taken you? Yeah. Mike, I, there was one thing I did know, and I knew from the age of eight that I wanted to be a lawyer. So that was, uh, that was firmly entrenched in my, um, in my psyche at that point. Um, and I, I made that decision at that time because I wanted to stand for people who couldn't stand for themselves. That's why I wanted to be a lawyer. So that's about as much as I knew at that point. Um, but I don't think it's until later and whether you're an AFL player or whether you've had, you know, massive experience in life, it's normally only until later that you're able to join the dots and see where their interlinkages um, are, you know, in your own trajectory. I love the cats. I loved the cats from when I was a baby. My nana loved the cats. My mum, who's a Morongo girl, Elizabeth Taylor, loved the cats. So that was always in the DNA. Um, and I knew that I loved footy, but I had no idea that, you know, 21 years later, I would end up as the vice president of the Geelong Football Club. Um, so, look, the, the trajectory, you know, what, what the career has looked like post the legal career, um, that has evolved as I've got involved in various pockets and on boards and I've done further qualification. It started to emerge and, and evolve, but... Um, what I normally say to people, you know, who are who are starting out is be good at the one thing, you know, be passionate, be really good at the one thing, understand what your own core business is, and then you can build around that. And for me, um, my, my core business has always been um, as a lawyer, um, whether that's been in business, in law firms, or now um, in sport um, as general counsel for Netball Australia. But Try and be good at at least one thing, be passionate about it, love it, because there's a whole lot more that's going to come um, from that one thing. So during, during this journey, have you, I mean, uh, we run a, a mentor program for our younger alumni and you very kindly helped out uh, with one of our students. So during this journey, have you had somebody that you've called upon as a mentor or somebody, a go-to person who's inspired you? to help you in any transitions or? 
Yeah, Mike, I've, I've got, um, I, I was thinking about this question the lead up to tonight and I've, I've got um, a couple um, who I, I, I want to mention for, for different reasons. Um, and I'm going to embarrass one of them because I see he's sitting on the call at the moment. So Barry and Keith Fagg, who I have had the absolute pleasure of being involved in Adam Cara House, Geelong's community hospice, Geelong's only community hospice, hospice for the last four or five years. Um, I, I didn't know um, Keith and Barry all that well before I, um, before I started working with them at Anamkara House. I certainly knew Keith and Barry from the footy club. Um, but when I started to work with those guys, they just completely blew me away for a couple of reasons. Not only are they extraordinarily good at what they do, they are fantastic um, businessmen. They understand our community. They, they understand Geelong really well and they understand because they care. They truly care. They truly care about people. They're extraordinarily compassionate people. Um, it, it is the commitment of Barry and Keith to, I guess, the concept of um, service above self that has really, really struck a chord with me. That is a, you know, I guess they might say that it's part of their family upbringing and it's part of their DNA, but that concept of working for a greater good, working for the individual, working for the community, doing so asking for absolutely nothing in return, and at the same time building a legacy and an amazing contribution to, um, to community, while still being fabulous people and you know having great lives, um, I, I have taken so many learnings from both of them as a result of that. That service above self concept is just so important. It's become so important to me, and it really resonates with me. Um, Mike, the other person I wanted to call out who's been a big part of my journey, um, and this probably won't surprise anybody, is Brian Cook, CEO of the Geelong Football Club. And, you know, the, the Geelong Footy Club's journey from good to great is one that that is well documented. Um, I guess why I, there's a whole range of reasons why I see um, Brian as a, um, you know, as a mentor and a friend, but as a mentor, because when he and Frank Costa and others started their journey at the footy club, there was no guarantee that we were going to have the success that we had. And it's easy to preach a mantra and have a message and have people run with you, um, carry with you, if you've had success. Because, of course, success has so many fathers and failure is an orphan. So at the point where you know, Brian and, and Frank Costa and others determined that um, we were going to place character before talent at the footy club. As Frank has said, it's about having the right people on the bus. Um, you know, we are really going to drive ourselves by our culture and our values. There was no playbook at the Geelong Footy Club for that at that point in time. And there was a lot of hope and a lot of faith. And yes, it was doing the right thing but there was no guarantee that it was going to lead to the success that we had in 2007, 2007 and what has happened from that point. So Brian as a mentor has really illustrated to me the fact that understanding who you are, understanding what is important, what are your values, what are you prepared to hold on to and how much courage are you going to have to hold the line when you are truly tested because that line was tested in that period up until 2007 and it has been since those things those things matter and if you hold to those things and if you hold to process and as steve hocking always says work out what your process is hold to process and everything else will take care of itself um, they've been very important lessons um, by my mentors, you know, in, in my course of life. There are many, many others, um, but those guys have been particularly important to me. Fantastic. Another I was going to ask you, and, and I never wanted to talk about COVID, but the disruption from the COVID pandemic and leadership, what has that sort of meant to you? Well, Mike, I've, um, as you um, and as everyone will um Note, I, I'm involved in a few organisations. So every single person on this call, every single member of our community and every single organisation has been 
impacted and some really significantly by COVID in some way, shape or form, um, whether personal or whether, uh, whether in business. And um, I, I, I've thought a lot about this topic because, um, you know, apparently successful people, there are seven habits of successful people. There is a process, there is a system, there is consistency for, for leaders and, and, and people who are successful. And that often involves doing the same thing repeatedly, doing it really well and just doing it again the next day. But when COVID rolled in, we're all suddenly faced with a world that didn't look like the one the day before. And I was getting up in the morning and I didn't know what my day would look like by the end of the day. Um, and not only that, um, you know, in, in leadership, um, relationships are everything. You know, the relationships that you have with the people around you are absolutely everything. And what we would normally do if we we're in a crisis is we would get in a room with the people who are going to support and assist us through this particular issue, no matter what it is. And we, we'd sort it out. You know, we'd talk it out. Body language is important. Seeing how people are responding, that's important. We couldn't do that. So, you know, we're all sitting here over an electronic device trying to deal with some of the most difficult, complex business issues, you know, how to keep our businesses, whether it was footy club, whether it was a TAFE, whether it was my own consulting business, just trying to keep fundamentally keep the business running, having no guarantee about what that was looking like. But I think for me, it was also just being aware that everyone was dealing with their own stuff. So kindness and patience and understanding if you were getting responses that were sharp or not consistent with the people that you were dealing with, um, you know, j just being mindful that this was not a normal world and people were had their stuff to deal with. And I'm talking in the present, I'm talking in the past sense, but I really shouldn't be because, you know, we're in the second wave at the moment. We look like we're coming out of it. Nobody's got our, any guarantees about, um, you know, hopefully we don't go into a third but everybody's still continuing to deal with this and people are starting to get very fatigued. So I think for me, um, it, and you know, I always consider myself to be, I hope, a kind and empathetic person, but it's just really understanding what the other person could potentially be going through on the other end of Zoom. Um, and I think that, I think that um, you know, it's also been very challenging as well because good people who have not deserved it have lost jobs and have lost their businesses um, in, in this torrid time that we are going through. And um, nobody set out to design that. Um, it has been it has been a brutal consequence. And, you know, I, um, I, I sit in footy, I sit in netball, I do some consulting work with other sport, as a sports in my consulting business. And the word brutalised is the one that I've applied to what has happened to sport, but that's happened to so many people in so many industries. So with people brutalised, you know, you've got to be compassionate and you've got to give people hope. You know, I've I've um, I've been sitting off a Zoom call about to come on 15 minutes um, into me coming on to the Zoom call and I'm leading it or I'm providing advice. And I've had to check myself because if I don't present a sense of hope, a sense of optimism, um, a sense of where, you know, we're going to get through this and this is the plan, then I'm no good to anybody at that point. So, you know, I've, um, I think like everybody, you know, everybody has had their moments. Um, but in terms of being a leader, really being aware of yourself and the image that you are presenting now because it's over electronics as opposed to in person has also been really important as well. Yeah, no, the excellent things there. In your business, looking at your business, and aside from governance issues and compliance, um, you specialise in building high performance environments. And does that start with working on the company culture? You're talking about Brian Cook there in terms of, you know, the values and the culture. Is that how you start looking at high performance teams and environments? Mm -hmm. Look, it, it certainly, um, the start point is definitely what the leadership within that organisation looks like. And you can have, you can have high performers who have produced outstanding results, but the behaviours don't stack up with where you need the organisation to go. 
that carries you to a point, but it's not going to carry you medium to long term as far as the organisation is concerned. So I think, um, you know, the start point is the people, but it's also honesty and transparency and some pretty, you know, some pretty um, honest discussions about where all that is sitting at the moment and what needs to improve. Um, Mike, at the start of the conversation, I mentioned that topic of core business. Um, what I see is organisations trying to do too much. I see them spending money in areas where they shouldn't be spending. It's okay, that's okay. It's, it's fine to have diversification, but if you're gonna do it, you have to do it really, really well. You've got to have systems, processes, the people with the relevant expertise to be set up in and around it. So it's okay to get big, it's okay to get bigger, but you've got to have the talent and the capacity um, behind you to be able to do that. Um, I think I think also understanding as a business what your core purpose is and why you exist is really important. Um, I know when Brian Cook came back from Harvard, one of the things that he learned in that process was asking himself the question, would it matter if this organisation exists or not? You know, that is a fundamental to the heart sort of question. Would it matter if my organisation, would it matter if what I'm doing right now existed or didn't exist? So. You know, it, it's that back at that purpose, back at that question about high purpose. Um, you know, one of the reasons why I love turning up at Netball, um, you know, as general counsel is, you know, it's a sport. AFL is the sport that I love, um, but I'm in Netball and I love it because the purpose to Netball is empowering women and girls through the sport of Netball. Um, what a fantastic purpose, what a sense of empowerment that that activity is giving people. And that that often drives me at the end of a very long day. So I think in driving a high performance team, you actually have to understand why everybody's there and why the organisation is there in the first place. And sometimes those things are hard to define. You've got to take the time um, to work your way around it and don't expect quick results. Um, you know, over the last five or 10 years, and I don't know whether it's because of technology, whether it's because of the Instagram, whether it's because of the media five second soundbite. Um, a lot of people expect results really quickly. Even if they are working hard, they expect results quickly. My experience has been that you've got to have patience. It can take years. You know, it took me, it took me 10 years of hard yards to move from community and state level footy into the, you know, into the um uh um, you know, into AFL. It took me 21 years in footy to be the, pre the vice president of the Geelong Footy Club. Um, yeah. I, I think there's something in the way. I, I, I love hard yards. I've got this painting up behind me um, this by this wonderful um, Aboriginal artist, um, Patricia Kamara. And there's, a, there's thousands of lines in this painting that's up behind me. And Patricia calls it bushy am dreaming, but I call it my hard yards because I want to be reminded every morning that these are the yards that I need to move through in order to get through a day, but in order to be successful and in order to push myself to keep going. So I think having those constant reminders around. So you asked the question about high performance teams. Um, Mike, there's a lot in that, but I think that there are four or five really basic fundamentals that people need to start with. And looking at your sort of volunteering, um, it's a big part of what you do in the community. It's a pro bono work, being on community boards. I mentioned a number of them um, at the beginning, but also I've, I've seen that you were uh, the big issue due to aged care services, Geelong Gallery. And it's a real diverse cross section of our community. You're not, you talk about having a passion or being, you know, really focusing in a particular area, but you're looking at aged care, you're looking at health services, you're looking at homelessness, education as well with, with go to aid. So it's a massive area to cover. So tell me about why is it important to you to be involved in all this? Mm. I just, I couldn't do what I do during the course of the day, Mike, if I didn't have this. Um, but it's just, I need to feed my soul. <laughs> I need to know that what I'm doing is actually um, contributing to somebody else. Um, and I, I don't stand on a soapbox when I make those statements. I, I honestly believe that. Um, 
I think that, um, you know, if we are in a fortunate position where we have the capacity to give back, then we should do that. All of those things that you've mentioned, though, I'm really, I'm, I, I love those things. I'm passionate about those things. They, they mean something to me. Um, it, it meant something to me to um, join Anamkara and to support people living with life-limiting illnesses and be caring for them um, and ensuring that people can die with dignity. Um, you know, that 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 is the core of Anamkara. It's giving yeah. people choice. So I think... Um, I think I've always felt, and you know, Morongo was wonderful for this as well. I mean, Morongo was about, you know, we were taught about service. Service was part of our curriculum, um, you know, giving to other people. Um, and I think that, I think, and, and what I see sometimes is people joining boards and organisations. And, you know, if you want a board career, what normally happens is, you start with not-for-profits and you move, you know, you move then into a commercial space and that that can build. Um, but people who are not passionate and not prepared to put in, even to those not-for-profit spaces, get one, they get found out pretty early on, and two, it just becomes too hard. It's too it's too hard, you know, at, at Dudagala, um, we used to meet in Footscray every month after work and I would be at that meeting until 10 o'clock at night and then I would drive home to Geelong after that and start my day in Geelong at 6am the next morning. Um, if you don't love that, if you are not passionate and you, do want, you don't want to make a contribution, it, it just becomes far too hard. So I think I think in all of those things, it's, it's just wanting to make a contribution and hopefully help somebody along the way. That's, that's what's fundamentally driven me from that activity. Yeah, and, and obviously making a real, real difference in the in the community. So turning to sport, your obvious love for sport yeah. and your involvement with footy, and and as you said before, with with netball. Tell us more about that and what attracted you to actually work in in football in the industry. Yeah, look, I am um, Mike. As the Morongo girls know on the call, you know, I I was wearing my. I think it started as a bottle green tunic which transferred into a navy tunic, which transferred into a netball skirt. Um, I, I was running around on those smelly Morongo hockey fields and um, and on the uh, on the tennis courts um, for a little while, but I was I was never going to be an elite level athlete. Um, I, my focus was uh, was on study and where that was going to go. So um, you know, it 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 started for me. Footy started for me as a 24 year old lawyer, um, and I. I I wanted to do something outside work, so I joined the Western Region Footy League Tribunal because, again, back to core purpose, back to core technical skill, I was a lawyer. Tribunals needed lawyers to be able to um, review reportable incidents of players, and that was a great way for me to get involved in it. But um, like most community activity, and that's what footy, footy is, footy is a community activity, um, I just I started meeting the most amazing people I made, I, and I have made lifelong friends through that sport. It, it gave me a community because at that point I was a single person doing my thing on a weekend and after work. And, um, you know, it gave me a, a friends. Um, it gave me my community. And um, things just started to build from there. But what I love about sport is the team nature of it. Um, I loved the fact that when you win, you know, you win together and you, you know, and if you're lucky to win a premiership, no matter what that might look like, you're going to have those bonds with people for life. And for me, nothing replaces sport um, from that perspective. I think it's, I think it's a bit of an adrenaline rush as well. Um, I think that, um, you know, when the cats are playing well and my goodness, are they, they going well at the moment? I think, I know. Yeah. <laughs> I know there'll be lots of cat supporters on the, the teams this evening. Um, you know, there's there's nothing that replaces that sense of togetherness and team, and it's something that you can involve your family in. So, so all of those things just built, um, you know, to the point that they are now. From your involvement with the that early football league, president of the Metropolitan League, you must have seen a massive shift in attitudes towards women's involvement in, in football. Um, so why do you think it's important that women are included in football at, at all levels now? My diversity, a breadth of experience, 
the fact that when you go into an environment, everybody is treated equally and everybody has a fair shot and we've created a level playing field. All of that stuff makes for better people, better communities, better society and better organisations. So, and you know, we're only talking about gender diversity, but of course diversity takes all different forms and these principles apply equally. Um, you know, when I started in footy, it, it, it was a while ago, it was a really um, robust, um, you know, testosterone driven, at times aggressive um, environment. And, um, you know, there weren't that many women in roles at that point. Most of the women that I was involved with when I started at the community level um, were doing the administration role within footy clubs. And what was happening was that after two or three years of very little recognition, um, huge workloads and no thanks, those women were getting burnt out and they were lost to the game, which I just thought was appalling and needed to change. So, um, so introducing culture and language, and I think we've done that really well at the Geelong Footy Club, ensuring that we do create an equal playing field, which again is what we have done at the Footy Club, just makes us all better, makes the place better. But what's happened now in with our AFLW side and our Geelong Cats AFLW side is that now girls, little girls, can see what they can be in a playing sense. And they never had that opportunity previously. You know, there was women's footy being played. Women's footy has been played for 100 years, but not on the big stage, not with that level of recognition, not with that level of resource and support. And um, it has fundamentally changed our world, I think, um, you know, having AFLW now in our community. Um, our, our participation numbers show us that, but, um, you know, there there is, and I know that there's a way to go with the AFLW competition, and I certainly hope that um, I can play a role in that, not only at Geelong Footy Club, but on the AFLW competition committee. There's, there's a way to go. It is not a perfect system, but we had to start somewhere. And I think, I think you know, perception counts for a lot. The ability to have an avenue to aim for and to achieve and to be able to get to that point as a female player, I think has fundamentally changed who we are and how we see ourselves as well. Um, and, you know, that that's only going to build. So all of those reasons, Mike, is the reason why I keep fronting up year after year. Um, in footy and my goodness it'd be lovely if we uh were able to get to that another premiership this year but uh we'll all keep a lid on it at this point in time and actually girls and women's participation in footy it's it's growing faster than men's i believe is that is that correct that is that is correct yep that, that's nearly five hundred thousand people play footy in victoria including grassroots club level and yep. about 100, I don't know, is it 150,000 women playing? Uh, Girls and women? Yes, and uh, half a million across Australia, half a million girls and women are, are now playing football across Australia. And in the AFL Barwon region, you know, we've had um, percentage increases over the last three or four years of about 40 to 50 percent. So it has been, it has exploded. Um, you know, those those girls can now see what they can be. Um, and even, you know, I've had fantastic stories about women taking up footy for the first time at age 35 because they've always been passionate about um, playing and now they've got an opportunity to do so. I mean, how good is that? That's fantastic, isn't it? That really is. Um, the current pandemic's caused upheaval to our whole community, as we, as we mentioned at the beginning but in particular throughout the AFL, and it's involved really, really tough decisions. And what's your role been? I know it's been sort of one of the worst periods for the Cats, but managing this at, at the Cats. Yeah. So as a, as a board member, um, the first thing we had to under, understand was um, how bad this was going to get financially. And of course, that was going to depend upon whether we could play games or not. And when in March, we were hopeful that we might be able to have some games played so our membership, um, our members would be able to come to GMHBA Stadium and see the Cats. And then it worked out as the weeks evolved that that was just not going to happen. So part of my role, um, you know, in relation to the whole organisation is, um, has been our communication with our members 
to ensure that our members every week knew exactly what was happening, what we were trying to do to hold the farm, I guess at that point, to stem the bleeding as far as the financial cash flow is concerned. What it involved, you know, unfortunately, tragically, was standing down a whole range of our great people um, at that point in time and making decisions regarding our org structure. Um, and it was really trying to see, you know, from a business sense, it was trying to just hold the fort to see what the world was going to look like. Because, of course, our members um, fabulously were, were still supporting us with, men, uh, with merchandise and our members held, you know, our members, if they could, held their money um, for the most part in the footy club. Um, and that that was just fundamental. So, so as a board, as a leadership team, we're all continuing to work that through. Our minds now turn to what 2021 looks like um, at, because there's a whole range of scenarios that we need to work through. But at the same time, it was providing support for our footy department because, of course, our players left for WA thinking that they were going to be away for 32 days. They're now going to be away. You know, if we make it all the way through, you know, to the grand final, it'll be more than 12 weeks that they will be away for. And some of them will have been away from their families for that period of time as well. So from a board perspective, it's making sure that we've had, and, and a um, CEO perspective, making sure that we've had the right level of support around our people who are in that Queensland hub at the moment. Um, because, you know, the show must go on, footy must go on, and we've got, our, got to give our guys every chance of doing as well as they can as we head into, into September. Um, so, look, it, it has been a challenge, but the people at the footy club are some of the most magnificent people I've ever met in my life. It's been all, all um, shoulders to the wheel. People have gotten on with it, and I, I just think it's fantastic for all of us that we're getting the results that we're getting at the moment because it's just been an absolute joy, hasn't it? Absolutely. No, just brilliant. Um, your appointment to the AFLW Competition Committee, congratulations on that. And, and looking at the AFLW, I mean, the Cats had a great first season, didn't they? They got into the preliminary final. Um, disrupted this season. How do you see the ongoing expansion and longevity of the women's game? Yeah, yeah. Well, it's here to stay. It's not going anywhere. It's only going to grow. The AFL has confirmed that um, uh, lists for our AFLW team, so we're holding to lists of 30 players, which is fantastic. They're not cutting those lists. Um, the um, the financial resource is going to, um, it has been adjusted a little bit, but there's still significant financial resource sitting behind our club. Um, I think eventually we'll probably see full expansion, um, you know, to the full 18 teams. We're at 14 at the moment. Um, that will eventually happen, but, um, I, and I'm not sure how long off we are um, in that respect. Um, I, I think it's going to continue to grow and develop. I think one of the key questions, though, is what, what does a professional AFLW female athlete look like? Because I think when all this started, people were expecting our female athletes to look, look the same, play the same, work in the same way as our male athletes. Our women all have part-time jobs, all they're studying, They've got other lives. They're playing for eight weeks a year at the moment. That is the structure of the competition. I think that's yeah. going to grow. We'll be building on our on our on our season um, as that progresses. But um, I think really it's defining what we mean and giving full support to our professional AFLW athletes. That's going to be one of the challenges for the footy club. But um, we are working on that at the moment, um, and I know that future is very very bright. Going back to the community and and Geelong. What do you believe is unique about our community and what role does the cats play in that community? You've touched on a lot of it already, but... Yeah. I, I think Geelong is unique, one, because there seems to be one or two degrees of separation between everybody. Um, <laughs> you know, as, as my... As my dear grandfather used to say, just be careful what you do in Geelong, Diana, because everyone's going to know your business pretty quickly. So that is very different to any other environment. Um, I think we're a community who cares about each other, who's prepared to support each other, no matter what that looks like. I think we have a strong sense of ourselves. You know, we've um, 
as a Geelong community, we've been through some tough stuff, you know, whether it's in our lifetime or whether it's in the generations before. Um, you know, we know what hard yards looks like, but we also know that supporting ourselves and supporting our community is absolutely number one. And the Geelong Footy Club's built around that, and we now have a community program. Um, you know, we invest over a million dollars a year in that community program, and it just brings everybody in. Um, when we won that premiership in 2007, that cup went to every aged care facility in Geelong, and it went to every single school. I don't know any other AFL club who would be doing that with that precious, precious cup. The ribbons weren't in good shape by the time it had finished, but that cup absolutely did the rounds. So I think we are so special as a community. Um, we are unique. We care for each other. We have a vision and a purpose, and we have we, we know what we want to stand for. All of those things separate us, I think, from everybody else. Yeah. Now, I was going to go back to, to women's footy. We've got a year 12 um, girl who's been invited to test at the NAB, AFLW and AFL combines on, the, I think it's the 3rd of October. We've also got, as, as a community, the old Geelong Club, which is Grammarians and Old Collegians and others in Como Park in, in Richmond. And I think they've got three or possibly four women's teams. And uh, they call themselves the Ogettes and, and, and doing really, really well. What would you say to girls setting out on their football journey? Yeah. Um, what I would say, Mike, number one is work hard and work harder than everybody else and just don't stop. Find people around you who not only are going to give you emotional support but are going to give you the expertise, whether that be nutrition, whether that be from a physical conditioning sense, whether that be from a skill sense, who are going to be able to develop you to where you need to get to. And I think I think just have courage. Just back yourself in. You know, footy is about taking your moments. And sometimes in a game or in a training drill or in a combine or in a trial, you only get one or two moments. So take your moment, go hard, don't look back, have courage, and it'll be okay. Uh, really, really good messages. Now, what about the Geelong women's team in season three? Yeah. Um, a couple of your stars, Meg, Meg McDonald. So, do you think they'll go well in season three? Oh, I, I just, I cannot wait. I cannot wait to see what's going to unfold um, in this season. Um, I know we've got the draft coming up, so that's really exciting. Um, we've we've signed on, you know, some of our our, our key players again. Cannot wait to see Nina um, back on the park. And, of course, Meg McDonald is an All-Australian fullback for us before her injury last year. Um, we've got a massive season ahead of us. Um, uh, as I understand it, um, games, hopefully we will all be able to attend GMHBA and see the girls play. But it's um, we, we're just building. We're building to something very, very special, Mike. Fantastic. I see. And, and Jane, who, Jane, I think she's a sports coach for the girls here at college, She's actually said the fabulous Olivia Purcell is our college girls women's team inaugural coach. So that's yes. fantastic. What a great Absolutely. choice. Absolutely. Now, my final question before I might open it up is just to say, you know, the big question that the game tomorrow after the incredible form the Cats have had over August, who's going to make way for Ablett and Selwood? And if they come back into the team, will it upset the chemistry of the team? <laughs> oh, the goodness, Mike, you've done your preparation for tonight. That is excellent. <laughs> um, yes, I think um, I think this topic of conversation started um, last week after we um, won so convincingly against Essendon. Um, that is an excellent question. Um, that is probably a little above my pay grade as Vice President, Mark, <laughs> so I appreciate that. Um, but I think I think that what we've done this year out of all of our players, we've just found that extra 10 to 15% across the board and everybody is lifted. You know, the men and goalers, the Parfords, um, the performance of those guys has just been truly exceptional. They're having their best seasons ever. Um, so I don't want to say who's um, who's going to be coming out, but um, my goodness, does it give us an amazing array of players to choose from? And a prediction tomorrow night? Uh, cats by fifteen. 
and who's going to be in the final? Jim, the Lions, they won last night, home ground. Will they get there? Oh, we'll be in the finals, Mike. I don't care about anybody else. <laughs> and, and what a difference that will make to Geelong if we lift our premiership, won't it? The spirit of Geelong, if they can bring that back. It would be, it would be wonderful. Uh, if anybody does want to ask a, a question, I will open it up. Mike, it's Jane Utting here. Hello, Jane. The uh, manager of the inaugural Geelong College women's football team. Very exciting. Um, Diana, I've just got a question. I'm really interested in your thoughts. Can you hear me okay? Yes, Jane, and congratulations on your appointment. That's fabulous. Oh, <laughs> thank you. Um, just, I'm very curious about your thoughts about the term or the acronym AFLW for the women and AFL or AFLM for the men. Going yeah. forward, I'd just I'd be interested in your thoughts on that. Yeah. Um, look, it's a, it's a good question, um, Jane, because I know that there's a number of schools of thought on that, um, you know, and, and one of those schools of thought has been that, um, you know, we're calling it AFL, but then we're separating, we're calling out women as something different by using the AFLW term. Um, I, I am not, um, I'm not adverse to the term AFLW because I think that it has such a strong resignation, um, sorry, it is, it is such a strong landing point with our community now. I think our whole community knows what AFLW is. I don't think that there's any lack of respect in using that term. Um, I, I know that some people have headed down towards the AFLM pathway, and that's okay. Um, but I, you know, provided we are respectful, we're using appropriate language, and my goodness, we're giving these women equal opportunity to perform at the highest level on our national stage. I'm quite comfortable with the acronyms that are that are sitting around that at, at this particular point in time. Um, obviously, of course, you know, if our if our women players um, had a particular view about that, then you know, I'd be really open to hearing about that. But I'm I'm just loving the fact that finally um, women are being given the prominence that they deserve and quite rightly should have playing footy. Thanks, it's Jane. Funny, it's funny you you mentioned that Jane brings it up, but I also think in in women's sport, actually, at some point, whether that label women will be will be dropped. You know, just looking at sport like Sally Pearson in athletics, um, Elise Perry is cricketer. She's not a woman's cricketer. She's a cricketer. Or Taylor Harris, she's a footballer, not a woman's footballer, which is what they use at the moment. At some point, I hope that 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 might be dropped as a, I suppose, as a subcategory, isn't it? But. I think we're going to, I'm going to use being English a, a sporting analogy, we're going to draw stumps there at 7.46. So Diana, look, I was just going to say, look, thank you so much. I think we've only just scratched the surface um, on so many areas we're going to talk about, but uh, just amazing insights on, on leadership, on diversity, uh, and all those things during these quite challenging times. Um, you are absolutely a pioneer in women's footy, there's no doubt about it. You've got three firsts. You know, the, the first one in the Metropolitan uh, Footy, first in the AFL Tribunal. I never actually mentioned that you rubbed off a Geelong player when you're on the Tribunal. I did. That's another the secret, story. The secret is yeah. out, Mike. <laughs> <laughs> and also, first is Vice President of the Cats, and you're absolutely not going to be the last at all. And I just think we'll see so much diversity with women across sport as an industry. And sport's just a wonderful platform for, for shifting attitudes. I say that as an English person and rugby and, and what I'm seeing across sport here in Australia. I think it is amazing. And the Addy today said the best is yet to come in women's footy. You were talking about the Barwon region. Um, I think it's really, really exciting. And again, using a sporting analogy, you're going to keep kicking goals. <laughs> on behalf of all our listeners tonight, look, just thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Mike. It's been an absolute pleasure. And um, thank you so much for everybody for, for joining us as well. And as you said earlier, it's great to see so many um, Morongo girls on the call and, and participating in the college um, fraternity. You guys have been wonderful to us over the 20 plus years that we've been part of the college community. And, um, we thank you for um, welcoming us and continuing to have us with the family.
Well, and we're going to continue to grow that through our online community and, and offering other events as well. Um, a big thank you to everybody for, for tuning in. Um, there is light at the end of the tunnel, not only to end COVID and get past these restrictions, but for Geelong to lift the premiership. I think that's the, the big thing. And being Are You OK Day, um, keep those conversations going, check in with each other, and please stay connected, stay safe. Thank you. Good night and go Cats. Go Thanks, Cats. Diana. Thanks, Mike. Thanks, everyone. Have a lovely evening, everyone. Bye bye.